manager. Currently, Robert Nickler, Nichols serves as a surveillance services group manager within the Air Traffic Services Directorate in the Program Management Organization. Within this role, he is responsible for all overall direction, management, execution, and implementation of AJM-231 surveillance systems and sensor programs, AIM-232 avoidance, so, so, pardon me, surveillance and broadcast services program, and AJM-233, the traffic collision avoidance system, the TCAS program, and the AIM-234 agency support programs. Nichols ensures all of the programs meet the cost, schedule, technical requirements, and the milestones. In addition to these duties, he also interacts with the Department of Defense as a coordination point with them, responsible to integrate the introduction of ADSB on DUD aircraft to ensure compliance with the current ADSB airspace mandate. Additionally, he is the United States representative on the Aeronautical Surveillance Panel for the ICO. Nichols has over 25 years of government service and has been with the FAA since 2000. Nichols is a graduate of the United, Na United States Naval Academy and served as an officer in the United States Navy. Let's welcome Mr. Nichols. Thank you. program from my perspective. A um, little background here as we go. So the program management organization within the FAA is our acquisition branch. I'm in the air traffic organization. So much of the FAST team and much of the work that's done here is on our safety side of the house on the AVS side. Uh, we work together and have been working together with them uh, since day one on this project. And we're very proud of that cooperation we've had. Um, I started as a federal employee in 2000 with the FAA, uh, as stated, I had prior military service. Uh, I've been working in the research world with this automatic dependent surveillance pro uh, broadcast ADSB since about 2004 and have worked uh, in that realm. And so it's, it's a program that I've spent the last 10 to 15 years of my life involved in. Uh, and it's a, it's a labor of love as we go forward here from my perspective and the intent today is to give you an overview on where we are from the acquisition, in some respects, what it means to the GA world. And I know there's a lot of concerns and questions out there. I had the opportunity to come here in 08 and not brief in this forum, but we had booths out on the, uh, on the floor out in the hangar. And the interest on ADSB was essentially non-existent. Uh, we had already awarded a contract. We were headed down this path. The agency was going this direction. But from a pilot's perspective, in addition, in, in particularly the GA pilot's perspective, they had no idea what was going on. It's just another thing the FAA is doing. Why are they doing this to us? And hopefully, I'm able to answer a few of those questions today. But first, I want to go through the program brief here. It's 27 slides. I will not talk to every slide, I promise. Um, there's a few in here that, that are informational that I hopefully this is made available on some website at some point that gives you a frame of reference for that as you go. All right, so again, I tried to frame a general program overview that we have and focus for the GA. Um, and, and really the foundation of the entire FAA's next gen, the next generation capability, uh, one of the key cogs of that was this satellite-based system known as ADS-B. Um, we have completed the FAA's component of the installation of all the ground components. You'll see some pictures here in a section. It was actually done last year. We've got over 630 radio stations out there across the country. It provides a surveillance capability to the controllers, our FAA controllers, which is consistent with the radar infrastructure that we have to provide air traffic services. That is, in a nutshell, what the FAA's requirement was from a surveillance standpoint. How did we have to put the radios out? How did we award the contract? It was based upon matching where we had radar today it will now become the preferred means of surveillance in our surveillance airspace. There's a slide in here that you will see what airspace that is. There's also a slide that shows what airspace it's not. And that's pretty enlightening when you look at it from the GA's perspective. It's 
we are not adding another layer of stuff for things that you don't already have to worry about from that standpoint. All right. GH community here, the opportunities for what you'll see with this ADSB capability uh, is, is interesting. There's a lot of benefits to you in some respects, but it's understanding what it means from that standpoint that I think is, is the big question and part of the reason that we're here to, to give this briefing here. So what is ADSB? Again, I, I can start very parochially here. Um, ADSB does mean something. It's a very interesting acronym, but Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. You can read the slide. I think the points to, to thing is this is a surveillance capability. ADSB, from the airplane's perspective, squidding information will go into the air traffic system. It'll end up as a as a plot or a track on the controller's display so we can separate it properly in the airspace that you're getting separation services, or if it's in airspace that you're getting flight following services, he will actually have that capability, an additional surveillance sensor that can provide flight following, all right? It's broadcast from the sense that the pilot does, you don't have to do anything. It's essentially connected to the existing transponder capability on your airframe, and it's an additional if you have a 1090 transponder and you choose to go down that path, we call it 1090 extended squitter. You double the bandwidth on the information and you go from 56-bit word to 112-bit word, a little technical there, but that's the spin on that side. We have two links. You could also choose to use UAT, which is called Universal Access Transceiver. That was originally defined as the general aviation link, and you'll see why in a second, but it has, it's an unencumbered frequency it allows us to do an uplink capability from our ground system, which provides a thing called FISB, Flight Information Services Broadcast, to the pilot. So the benefits to GA. So first of all, these new level of safety and efficiency, ADSB is better than radar. It has a greater update. It has better accuracy. If you're in an air traffic scenario and you are getting air traffic services, this will be a better service to you. It provides more and efficient spacing, routing, in a lot of those areas, it adds to the existing radar airspace. It does cover what we usually call non-radar airspace. I have a slide that shows that. It also will provide better information from, you know, God forbid, but in a search and rescue activity, which is a, a big deal, it does not replace the ELTs, but it provides a capability in that search reach if to get out to good information so it can be provided to start that search phase if, again, God forbid something happens that you have to put out there. Those are the top two bullets here. The next two refer to a thing called ADSB in. When we talk ADSB and you hear the word out and in, it's always in reference to the cockpit. The reason for that is, is the original ADSB program was standards that were done in RTCA to build avionics, and that's always from the airplane's perspective. So when you hear the word ADSB out, that's information that comes out of the airplane. ADSB in is information that can be ingested by a properly equipped aircraft. There is no mandate for you to have the ADSB in capability. That is your choice. ADSB out is the mandated activity that will take effect in 2020. I always call the ADSB in thing, it's free traffic and weather. All right. It is maybe not the same as you can get from XM and some of the other WSI weather providers because they may not have it right there on the surface when you're doing pre-flights, but at altitude in the airspace, you'll get a weather product, you'll get special use airspace products, you'll get NOTAMs, there's a list, another slide here in a second, that'll go through the list of those items. But that is in the cockpit on a cockpit display of information, the CDTI that you can have, or another display mechanism. This allows portable type devices that you can't have in the ADSB out piece. So there's some capabilities here on the end because it's not mandated that gives flexibility in particular to the GA pilots. I will bet that you've gone out and walked around in all the booths from the vendors and they're all selling you stuff now. And most of this is related to the ability for them to provide this uplink product to put it into the cockpit. Um, these are provided at no cost, obviously. They don't necessarily match exactly, for instance, what WSI or XM or some of the others can provide. But that was one of the major enticements early on when we were looking at the program, it says, how do you get the GA to equip at some level so they get some benefit? And this was the intent. It was to provide that ADSB in capability. Here's another couple of slides that show that the traffic is a thing formally called traffic information services in a broadcast mode, or TISB. Uh, it essentially provides you a traffic picture 
of what air traffic has from all radar sources or from ADS-B if you've got it. So you'll get a direct ADS-B to ADS-B from an airplane that's equipped, but if he is not equipped and he's under radar contact, that radar will go to a processor and that is uplinked to your cockpit. You'll get a service volume around your airframe, which is a hockey puck, 3,500 feet above and below you and about 15 to 17 miles around you. That's the hockey puck you'll fly with, right? And that will, and if you're not squidding an appropriate signal for us to recognize that your radius being equipped on the ground, we don't offer the uplink service for that. Now, you may say, all right, I have my handheld and I can see that you're in someone else's hockey puck and you're going to see a disjointed one. But that is one of the cost of entries from the FAA's perspective is you have to be squinting an ADS-B out capability that's appropriate to the rule, such as you can get the uplink service for the, for the traffic product. That does not exist. And this traffic product is on either of our links, 1090 or UAT. The uplink of the second one at the bottom there, the FISB, the Flight Information Services Broadcast, is only on the UAT link. And the reason is, is it's a very, it's a broadband information. It would take up the 1090 link. And 1090 is also used for TCAS and, and MODAS and other things that are safety related. So we couldn't encumber that link. So that was the, the other side of why the general aviation link UAT was generated and built was so that we could uplink the flight information services broadcast, the FISB products. And you'll see in a second is graphical products as well as a significant number of textual products that are included in that. These just show some graphics of what it looks like. I think these, um, forget where these pictures are actually taken. We did a lot of the early work up in Alaska under Capstone. And some of these pictures may in fact reflect uh, photos that were taken from that. So. Here's the weather products or the FISB products, and not just weather, but they're also special use. So you can see that we've got air mets, convective sigmets, the METARs and species, uh, NEXRAD, which is a graphical product. Uh, you have no TAMs that'll show up, PIRAP sigmets, special use airspace, TAFs and amendments to the TAFs, uh, temperatures aloft and winds aloft. We're also looking at adding five additional products right now that we're working with our vendor. Uh, to see about, and it includes echo tops and lightnings and a few other ones. I don't have the list of those five here, and I'm not going to offer those specifically because we haven't made the direction to, to go down that path yet. It's an investment decision we have to make on our side. So here's the required airspace in green, and it's essentially the same as transponder airspace in addition to the mode C veil with a couple of additional things in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast. Um, it looks like a lot of airspace, everything over class B, everything over class D, everything above 10,000. No class D or E, nothing in the, in the non-towered. And if you take this slide and you go to the next one, this is the rule airspace where you're required to have ADS be out in accordance with the rule on January 1st, 2020. It doesn't look like a lot of airspace below 10,000 feet. And this was one of the, and so it's consistent with where your mode C veil is right now, where you have to have a transponder. All the red ones are class B, all the yellow ones are class C. Everything above 10, obviously you have to be equipped at that level. But for the, for the low end GA that's flying below that level in your, in, your, in your weekend flyers, the areas that you have to equip is not that great. And I wanted to highlight this slide here for everyone to get a look at that. Go ahead and take pictures of it before I flip. All right. Do you guys get a picture of it, everyone? All right, good. Now, here's a different spin. I know out in the booth out there, Jim Marks and, and Alex Rodriguez that are sitting out there at the ADSB booth, and I would offer and welcome for you to, to go visit them um, during the week. We show an ADSB coverage slide. What we have failed to do, and we recently have been able to get are slices that compare where we have radar coverage and where that radar coverage is providing information to our controllers for air traffic separation services and where we have ADS-B coverage. This is a 500 foot slice AGL and you can see the light green basically outshadows the dark green where the radars are. So we got about 300 radars we use for air traffic services. I showed you earlier we got over 630 radio stations. One of the design criteria that we put into the program was we had to have a standoff distance of these radios because they transmit our 1090 and our radar infrastructure receives on 1090. I couldn't interfere with the MODES receivers on the airframe, on the, uh, at, at those uh, radar sites. 
the stand, minimum standoff distance is usually about 17 miles. So the very first sites we put in, we did Louisville was one of our first key sites. Radar on the airfield, we had down I-70 to the west, 17 and a half miles away, one radio station, and I-70 to the east, 17 and a half miles, we put the other radio station in. And what you end up getting is a significant overlap or additional coverage to meet the basic requirement of where we were going with this. So is that 17 nautical? 17 nautical, yeah, I use nautical, I'm a Navy guy. So it's, you wanna convert the statute, you can do it, but yeah, we will <laughs> tend to do that. What that in, resulted in is essentially this slide. And you can see the light green where we have coverage. Uh, you will notice out in the Gulf of Mexico, that's not a mistake. We actually have 12 sites out on platforms. One of the other early activities that we did was to provide low altitude surveillance coverage out to the oil rigs um, because the benefits associated with that, we get free sighting on those rigs and uh, early equipage of a bunch of the aircraft, S um, 70, the uh, 76s and 92s that fly out there, the Sikorskis, as well as uh, some of the lighter helicopter fleet that goes out. It was a huge benefit for, for that and it provides significant overflight at the high altitudes for areas we didn't have radar out over the Gulf. So early benefits to the program and for that capability, but those are real. Um, wherever you're from, this, you know, the intent is to have this available on the FAA's website so that you'll be able to not only just look at this slide, but when we get it done, be able to zoom into your local geographic area to see what does it mean. So if you're Central Ohio somewhere, you want to take a look, what does it mean for you in Central Ohio if you've got coverage, all right? And you can see that the East Coast is very dense in radar, so we're very dense in the ADSB capability, so there's not a lot of extra. But as you head to the central part of this country, you're going to start to see significant changes in that respect. Same dialogue at 1,500 feet. There's not quite as much, pretty much, and we don't need to go much farther than that. Um, by the time you get up to about 5,000 feet, they're fairly consistent. All right, you got your pictures. Uh, this is a pretty busy slide. This is our standard ADSB program on a page. Uh, we use this as a way to show how we have progressed through the program uh, since the FY10 timeframe. So we did the early phase of the program from 07 when we led, awarded the original contract to our vendor uh, out to about the 10 to 12 timeframe. And then we've done in another segment from 14 to 20 that we're looking in right now. So I break this slide into three areas. I'm not gonna necessarily talk about the middle area because that's the ADSB in applications for mostly a transport, so it doesn't really apply to this audience. But down the bottom, we call the pilot advisory world. This is putting in the radio stations and doing the uplink services, why we call it that. That was all predicated on getting the radio stations out there connected to surveillance sources, existing radars, and being able to provide that service. We completed the 634 radio stations that we needed to do our base capability last year. We're adding because we have new requirements, and it's classic. Uh, I will end up roughly with a count of about 663 radio stations nationwide um, by the 17 timeframe. The key here is this is done. We have had lots of programs in the FAA where the FAA talk with both the uh, transport category, general aviation, and said, hey, go buy something, we're gonna make you do something, and trust us, we're gonna put our stuff in. And then we didn't. So in this case, when we first put the program out there, because it was a huge investment to the government, we did not save any money in infrastructure. We added a layer of infrastructure. In order to get Congress to justify us doing that, we had to show that there was significant benefit on that thing and go forward. So these pilot advisories and these capabilities that we put in were huge in that respect. And we also had to say, if you're gonna do it, do it early. We did it, our plan was to have this done seven years before the rule took effect. So we missed that by three months. So we had done 97 months of the program, it went to 100 months. So if you're an OMB guy and you know about stuff on how we measure government programs, I'm allowed a 10% variance from day one of the program. I'm, I was under 3% variance on this. So we did very well from that perspective. So we met our goal on the bottom side. The top side is connecting that information for air traffic services purposes onto all of our automation platforms. And you've got, you can see there's four groups that we have as we put them in there. 
In the en route realm, those are the air traffic control centers, high altitude stuff. You do talk to them because that's where you get a lot of the flight plan stuff that you do. But there's 24 of those. We have 23 of the 24 done right now. I think we're down to the last is finishing up Hawaii this summer to get that onto ERAM, our mic their micro air system there. Terminal World is the big concern for, excuse me, the big concern for us. We have roughly 64 sites done right now at 160. Those that are not done, they're, they're about 95, are a thing called the old Arch 2Es. They are at small Class D and Class C type airports. Yes, Class D, even though it's not required, we still provide it, so I wanted to highlight that point. The program within the FAA that's doing that is a thing called TAMR. TAMR's had some starts and stops and funding profiles, so this is not because we weren't ready, it's that the sister program or the receiving program was not ready. And you can see that the FY16 through 19 activity, if you add those numbers up, it's in the mid 90s and that's essentially what's left. It's those two E sites at the, we've done all the large TRACONs, all the large airspace, all the class B and C stuff is essentially done. The surface advisory is a capability we put on our large airports. It complements a system called ASDX and it's on the 35 major airports that we have. We're adding a new capability at nine more ASSC. Um, one of the highlights I always like to mention, I flew into Tampa last night. I, I live in the Baltimore area just outside of DC. So I flew southwest into Tampa and Tampa has no surface radar capability. It's the largest, busiest airport that doesn't have one. It's the first one below the 35 plus nine. And it's always interesting when I get pushed back from the airports when I'm trying to do my job and they're like, you can't take this away, you can't do that. And I always say, well, how does Tampa manage? It's very interesting. So I flew in very safely last night. I think the pilot was taking flying IFR because he hit pretty hard, but it's okay, he's a fine instrument, but he needs to train. Uh, but it's always interesting to see. So this has been a big deal for us is to add an ADSB layer at the surface and we're equipping vehicles there. And the last one is in the ocean. So we have three platforms, eight top platforms at three of our centers. We're also looking to work with some international stuff because we run the entire Pacific Ocean at high altitude for ICAO and using these platforms to provide that. And there's a new initiative, a space-based initiative that's coming in that's going to work that. Big program here. You can see one of the things that we drive up to the right is really a little meter, rule-driven ADS-B out avionics equipage. We're over 10,000 right now. The mix of that is roughly 300 air transport, so it's about 95 to 9,600 uh, general aviation or high NGA and some RJs included in that number. We need to get to a number of about 160,000 is roughly the number that we're looking at. There's about six to 7,000 air transport guys that we have to cover and it leaves about 150 or so GA that we anticipated that would need to equip. We're well behind the curve to meet the, the rule mandate which is a little over four years and four months away. So that's a highlight here from the standpoint and I know in some of the other forums that I've been in, the pushback from GA is it's too costly. Why do I need to do it? I'm sure the questions will come. Um, and obviously we're working, a few of the next slides that I have relate to some of the activities we've been doing to try to help in that arena. This is just a nighttime picture of where the radio stations are. Um, I wanna point out one thing. It looks like a very interesting cluster uh, in the Colorado area. And that's just due to a special program that we have introduced with the state of Colorado. Um, that's a wide area multilateration system. So one of the early decisions when we made the program was, do we add radars? Do we do this thing called wide area multilat? Or do we do ADS-B? And from a cost perspective and some of the other performance measures, ADS-B won out, um, but you still needed to equip and it caused a requirement for a change in avionics, which was one of the considerations. State of Colorado in their ski season uh, with a lot of their uh, ski areas, they have a one in one out because there's no surveillance down below normally 10 to 12,000 feet on the approaches into those airfields. But they were looking at, and this was before they had all this extra money because of the marijuana stuff that they got, but they, 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 had, um, they had money. They were, were looking for added surveillance to provide capabilities now during the ski seasons. They're, these are localized, peak demands that they were trying to meet. So they came to us, we worked with them and we decided, all right, we'll do a wide area multilat. You can use your existing modus. 
transponders. There's no change in the cockpit, and we can provide those services. And we do that at Denver Center now. It's not local. It's through the center at Denver. What this highlights, though, is the complexity of the density of the radio stations you need for that. Uh, we went with 600 and so radio stations that we needed to do ADSB nationwide. If I had gone multi it would have been about 2,500 radio stations. Significant cost difference. And this highlights that difference in Colorado, the density that we had to put in there. It's a lot of radios. We cost shared with the state, so we used a very interesting public private partnership with the state and some public, some public and private funding that they had in that to help defray some of the initial costs on that. We're now including that in our baseline to pay for that as we go forward. I'll just highlight that. And you can see we also have Alaska, the lot of radio stations up in Alaska, Hawaii, Guam, and Puerto Rico, which are the other one down to the right that we're covering. You will also notice pins in Mexico. There's two in Cancun and then there's one on the mainland part. We are actually integrating three radio stations on Mexican soil that will feed the FAA's infrastructure to cover the southern regions of the Gulf of Mexico and will share that information with Senium, the, the, the ANSP in, in Mexico, so that they have that same coverage. Uh, the, state of, the country of Mexico has recently put out a mandate that they will follow the ADSB mandate that the FAA has on the 1090 side. They will not impose the UAT side, so they won't provide the GA link. But in 2020, when you fly into Mexico, you're going to have to be equipped with ADSB out on the 1090 link if you, if you fly down that airspace. I'm not going to run this slide. This is a um, video of uh, sort of a snapshot in a day that shows what ADSB stuff we're seeing out there in the NAS right now. You can see the concentrations. West Coast in the LA, San Francisco area, and GA world, and there's a lot of air transport work in there in GA. Up and down the East Coast, those flights off the uh, East Coast flying are a lot of early equipped aircraft, and you'll see the slides on those. And then you can see the point that I mentioned earlier in the Gulf of Mexico, those flights go out to the platforms daily. Uh, this is a web activity that I'm not going to try to run. So one of the early things we did in addition to putting out the radio stations is we worked with Air Transport to try to get some early equipage in advance of the rule. You can read through this page, but we have a lot of work going on with the high end working with Rockwell, working with ACSS and Honeywell in the large air transport avionics world, as well as a number of the vendors. Early benefits, JetBlue, some of those East Coast flights were on the page before is JetBlue going up and down the East Coast. UPS, if I had to run the video, you would have seen at about 2 o'clock in the morning what we call the UPS bloom coming out of Louisville. All of their airplanes are equipped. All the box carriers come in during the night into Louisville. About They're in there by 10 to 10.30. They do their box sort. By 2 o'clock, those guys are punching, and they're heading back east and west, and it's incredible bloom. Every one of their airplanes is equipped, all right, all 164 that they actively run. We're working with um, Honeywell and, and Rockwell on some other ones here, and those are active work that we have. So that's air transport. In the GA world, we've done the same thing. Most of this work has been done. The intent was to get some early work, get the supplemental type cert, the STCs, but then the bigger thing was the AMLs on those things that start to show that the non-recurring work between connecting your ADSB capability to the appropriate antennas, to the appropriate position sources were done, and you had a list for your installers so that they knew what they could and couldn't do. Now, what do you need to do to equip for ADSB and what's necessary from that stand, all right? It's obvious that you need a key position source. One of the big questions that always comes, why can't I just take my cell phone, GPS, why does that work? It's as accurate as what you need, and, and it's probably true. The key is, from an aviation and an aviation safety standpoint, it's the integrity and the availability of that information that is the driver and the cost and the reason that you can't use those that you don't get with a cell phone or you don't get with those things that's on your iPad because it doesn't care if it's gone for a minute or two. It's a big deal in the aviation world if we're trying to do air traffic services if you can't have it and you don't have the integrity values that says, here's my containment radius, I have a very high probability that what you're saying is in fact correct. So that becomes a driver for that. Second bullet here, if you don't fly in the, in, if you fly in uncontrolled airspace, you never have to equip, all right? There's no mandate to equip, all right? If you don't have electrical systems, light sport, those guys, they don't have to equip, all right? So those rules, it's the same as your transponder rule that sits out there. Three key things that you need in order to meet the requirement, a GPS receiver, all right? In most cases in the GA world, the way it's being set up by the manufacturers from a commercial 
and business process is that they're integrating a GPS WAS engine into the boxes or ensuring that if they've got a certified GPS WAS to the appropriate TSOs that we're looking for, and it's the 145, 146 that's out there, that those are WAS enabled, they meet the augmentation capability, and they will always meet the accuracy and integrity that we're looking for from the rule. You'll never have to worry about that. You get to pick whether you use extended squitter, which is the 1091, or UAT, which is UA, uh, it's on 978 megahertz as the frequency, any appropriate antenna connection. Fairly simple, but obviously complex when you have to go out and costly at some level when you go out and talk to your installers. The next four slides, I am not going to brief. I'll just tell you that the yellows, for the most part, are air transport. The blues are GA, high-end GA, and some RJs in here. The summary of the next four slides, and I'll let you take pictures. How's that? So this is slide one. I'll tell you when I'm done. Yeah, everyone get slide one? Oh, now I'm dying. It's not, it's not moving. My presentation has just died. I talk too much. Maybe that's it. Let me see if I can get out of that. Can't even get the mouse to work on this. So. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. Let me. This, yeah, this maybe the battery's died. Yeah, it just died. Really dead. All right, so we'll run those four slides once we can get the presentation back up. I um, want to highlight the fact that you should visit the manufacturers out there. I think the price points that we're looking at right now, so oh, I really screwed this up. So, Price point that you're looking at right now, I know, Mark, I screwed it up. Um, I think when I first started working on the program with um, Capstone, it was about 15000 bucks, And I think there was one vendor, Garmin, that was making the stuff they were working. And that price point now from a ADS-B out capability with a WAS engine and an antenna and the installation cost from two manufacturers right now is down under $2,000. Early on, we had had, um, what do I need to hit here, Fast Team? Or which one, Mark? Studio user? This thing, this thing froze, yeah, go ahead. And, the um, price point that was asked when we were first working with um, working with AOPA was you got to get it down to about fifteen hundred dollars. We're very close to that right now, so it's it's about two grand uh, for two vendors. Uh, there's a group called Nexa Capital which is working with L3. Uh, that unit is out there. I think they're offering a unit that, with the subsidy that they're putting out, is about fifteen hundred. So it's right about that price point now. Now that was a price point from about eight to ten years ago. I don't know where the price point is now with, you would assume that with inflation it's gonna go up a little bit, but don't know if that's the case. I think in the next four years, as you look at when you need to get your airplane equipped and updated, whether your manufacturers and your distributors and the installers have the workload and the, and the bandwidth to do that, the estimate is that they do now, but if you wait to the end, you're gonna be stuck and you may not, or you'll possibly be restricted in being able to fly into airspace that you would otherwise have access to. All right, so there's the presentation. This died right here is what happened. Um, that's, go to that slide right there. Yes, sir. Perfect. Let's see if this is, here it is. All right, I'll slide back. That was slide two, so you can get this picture. You can read there's about 10 GA manufacturers that are out there right now. Free Flight, Avidyne, Bendix King, Navworks, ACSS makes some big ones. Um, this is the last one of the, and we said the first four ADS be out. Also highlight the fact, is the L3 product right there that's the one that is now being offered with the Nexa Capital uh, Venture Cape. They're gonna buy 10,000 of these things up front and be able to offer them uh, at about $1,500 because of an investment they're making. Last two things you'll see here is some projects that we're working that are, that are adding to this level of um, capability. So we're doing some additional work with free flight. Uh, we are replacing all of the airplanes in, in Alaska that we bought once before Capstone Avionics. We're upgrading them for every aircraft in Alaska, about 400 of them. We're doing that. 
These next two slides are ADSB in. So these are integrated products. Again, not required by the rule to have ADSB in, but the capability to put this out there and have that, uh, in fact, works well. I'm sorry, keep going. I just need to do one thing. All right, so this is the man behind the tent that's coming up to fix this here. For the... Let's see. And we've got a couple of slides that go on here that show this. The best way to work these is to basically go out to the, uh... oh, you're killing me here. <laughs> I need to get back Thank to slideshow because I'm stuck. You took me out of slideshow. Resume slideshow. All right. Got it. Not an important slide here. It does show that this is a graph that shows where we are with the with the equipage rates getting toward the rule. Um, obviously, we we need a there's a lot to go. Um, it's one of the first things, and if you visit uh, the ADSB booth out in the hangar, uh, Alex Rodriguez and Jim Marks out of uh, ABS, and one's from AFS and the other one's from AAR, so Aircraft Cert and Flight Standards, um, there's a website that you have. So after you get your installation, either your installer or you yourself can go on to this website, provide your end number um, and information to this thing. And what we're able to do with our monitoring, all the radio stations, we bring the data in, we can provide a report back to you that says you're compliant or not, that you're meeting the rule. And so it's a good check. Uh, it's expected that um, some of the manufacturers, I mean, the installers will, will choose to use this route also. But you as, a, as an individual, the intent is in the future, if something happens on the system, we'll be able to let folks know that, hey, it looks like maybe a transponder is not working right. You need to go take a look at it. That's not an enforcement action. It, it's an informational action is the intent is to get out ahead of that from the standpoint of not having to have someone that's his, his uh, avionics no longer works properly on that end. And we're able to see those types of things. We'll be working with uh, AFS and AR to do that work as we go forward. Last slide that I'll put up here is this thing called the Quip 2020. Um, all the money that I've spent on the program enticing avionics manufacturers to start building both from the air transport and the GA world um, really hasn't gotten the numbers from a quip standpoint to where we are. And if we're now within that four to four and a half year window of having to have everyone equipped, uh, obviously the administrator, as we briefed the program, said, I'm not sure that the traction's there. What do we need to do? So it was a decision that, and this was done jointly between industry, uh, the aviation community, the operators, the owners, as well as the FAA, it says, you know, we got to do something to see if we can't get the message out and do a better job of making sure everyone understands and pushing in any way, shape, or form that we can so that we don't have problems leading up to the mandate. So obviously that was the administrator took this on. Actually, he has assigned it to the deputy administrator, Michael Whitaker. He was here yesterday for those that, that had a chance to listen to him. Um, and we started this Equip 2020 work. And there were five working groups, we're down to four now. One of them is focused solely on general aviation. And it's the general aviation equipage work group. All of the manufacturers participate in this that build general aviation avionics. Most of the alphabet groups participate. AOPA is heavily informed and involved in it. The Light Sport EAA is in there. There's a number of others that are in there. Gamma is um, is one of the co-chairs, uh, Jens Hennig, anyone that knows Jens from Gamma, uh, is one of the co-chairs of this group with the intent of making sure that we came up with approaches to make this thing cost conscious to the GA community. And as a result of this thing, over the last several months, these initiatives to get the price down below two grand uh, has in fact come out of the, the working forum that we've had here. And, and I think it'll continue to, to flow in that direction over the next several years. So that's the end of my slideshow, formally. Um, I'm not sure I can open it up to questions. Um, and anyone that may wish to throw rotten fruit at me or something, I'm, I'm willing to take it on, so. Uh, my name is Ray Jenkins. I'm with uh, Commercial Space Transportation with Hi. the FAA. Hi. I, I, I'm just wondering, is, are there any airspeed limitations and altitude limitations to the ADB, ADSB technology? Because Spaceship 2, Virgin Galactic, Boeing, Capsule, et cetera, they're going to be using this kind of technology. 
So the, the dynamics of the avionics are built are going to have the same test dynamic requirements that you'd have for a transponder requirement. So that's going to be altitude up to 60,000 feet is where we control our airspace. And at the speeds that you'll see um, the use. I know DOD has to do ADS-B. They're going to do a different test because they fly it a lot faster than the air transport do. They pull a lot more Gs in their airframes. Their avionics have to withstand that and still work properly. Nothing that I know of has been built to support a rocket launch at the G-forces that they take at launch uh, up to the 100,000 foot. I know that we've actually flown, you guys have actually flown a few. I know Darren Magnus used to work in that group and I know he and I have talked previously, but I know they've done some testing of that and some stuff, but it was not designed for that at that point. Um, it could be used for that. Yes, and, and so on the reentry side, it's the dynamics are even far more important with heat and everything else that goes on. And, and then that affects the radio waves and, and, the, and the powers and stuff that come out. So you're looking through that to radio stations that are gonna be blinded by it. So the ability to see that. With the advent of this thing coming out by Arion, which is a space-based ADS-B, so I'll wax all eloquently here for a second on those that know the Iridium network that went up several uh, decades ago, a couple of decades ago, they're putting up the next generation of Iridium satellites now. There'll be 66 satellites in orbit. They've added an ADS-B payload to the new generation that can see ADS-B out-equipped aircraft worldwide. And they're planning to provide this as a service, as a surveillance data service to ANSPs across the world. The Canadians are invested in it. The Irish are invested. The, the, um, the Danes are invested. So anyone that would fly a transport over to Europe, you're going to be in space-based ADSB coverage. That could be used for the saddle, for that reentry, because they're now looking toward the satellites and they don't have that heat shield in front of them which wouldn't, it still might affect some of, there's a cone that you'll have that you can look to, but you may be able to be seen. So that's part of the, what I would look at, but yes. Yeah, you need to make sure that the folks on the TV Thanks. can hear Thanks that. So much. Uh, for the air traffic control specialist sitting behind a, a en route or approach control, what does he see, he or she see different on their radar screen or is it uh, just more? Uh, 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 it's a great question. Yeah. Because in addition to adding another surveillance layer, which we could call the ADSB as a as another surveillance layer, we've actually introduced a thing called fusion on all of the automation platforms. If you were to see all the money we've spent, fusion was the driver and the cost in this thing. So in previously, if you're an NROD controller and you've got a sector of airspace, you have one radar that's giving you information. And it's, you lose that radar, it drops down to another radar. But it's one radar and you lose that when you drop down if you run out of radars you got a procedural all right and you really have to open everybody up well in those cases the guy in the sector beside you his secondary second radar down might not be in your stack but still sees your airspace or a good part of your airspace so we didn't see that we couldn't use it so when we added adsb because of the update rates and everything else we also invested a significant amount of money in doing total fusion on all the platforms. So what we now have is the ability of bringing all the surveillance information from all the radars. And so I've got one radar way over there that can see over here. It doesn't see a track way over there very well. So he's really at the bottom of the stack. But if I ever get down there because I lose everything else, I still have information. And I might have to go to increase separation required, but the controller still has information. So fusion became one of the other activities. In my little slide earlier that I showed with the rollout of those, that was one of the drivers, not getting ADS-B on it. The driver was getting fusion up and running and getting the controllers used to seeing fusion. And some of the idiosyncrasies you're going to see because in the past, and, and this is the truth, you had one radar, you're supposed to figure out where the radar is. So you survey the thing and you give them the lat long and it plugs it in. Some of the radars were off by half a mile I don't know how they screwed it up but I, I am but they did but when that one radar was coming in all the bias was the same direction in the same magnitude so in relative terms everything was fine in fusion that no longer works so we had a lot of little technical idiosyncrasies things that we never cared about in the past but in fact could get to that point 
So fusion became the thing. The controllers now have all of the surveillance information. And in 2020, the symbology to the controller, he will, the normal symbol he will get will indicate that I have ADSB on this guy. When ADSB is lost, and we'll be able to sense that, the symbol will change. And he'll know, all right, I better have a secondary surveillance source, some radar, but he'll start to see whether he had lost the surveillance as it goes down. Yes, sir. The, uh, the system is relying on WASP for the aircraft to report their position and altitude. And so WASP is tied to the GPS satellites, obviously. Is there any concern about our greater dependence on GPS satellites going forward? And what, if anything, is being done about that? So there is great concern about the ability to influence in a negative way GPS signals, all right? Because the signal level at the receiver on the airframe for the GPS receiver is very low. So it's easy to jam it, easy to put bad information in. So from the FAA's air traffic perspective, the ability for us to validate that an ADS-B transponder that says, he says he's transmitting from that light up there. And I'm, you know, the position packet that you open up in there, which is based upon the supposed good GPS in the airframe says that's where he is. We have validation techniques that we're using at our ground stations and on our automation platforms that says, was there a radar guy up there? So do I have a mode S track up there? Do I have a radar track? Or do I have some gross multilat? So do I have a radiating element from that point in space that I can somewhat triangulate on, not to the level of giving air traffic, but that says, yeah, in that general area, I got a transmitter. So I can validate that. If I can't validate that signal, I don't give it to the controller. So he won't get bad information. And that's the one protection we've done on the air traffic side of that. You're going to see in the ADSB in applications in the airframe at some level, at least in the, in the high end world, in the air transport world, that validation technique will be done through a TCAS. So you'll have to have that connection at some level. How we would use it, and that's for a, separate, a spacing type application. In the advisory sense, the loss of integrity values in those signals are what would, have, would protect the GA information that you have. But because those are advisory in your cockpit, you're still supposed to have your eye sweep and use those other techniques that you've got. So it's not the sole dependent activity that you've got. So yes, we recognize that that's a concern. I am not getting rid of radars in the NAS. Remember I said earlier that this is an added investment. We will reduce the footprint of radars, but not eliminate them because it's now not necessarily the preferred method for surveillance. And this sole, one of the key reasons was, was because of the potential of GPS vulnerabilities. Yes, sir. You really won't have a full up operational test of uh, every component until after 2020. I guess uh, I wonder rhetorically uh, about the uh, chances of discovering interferences, saturation, and so on in places like the Northeast or around Atlanta or Los Angeles and that sort of thing that will then require further, further upgrades or further mandates to keep the system working? So it's a great question. Um, obviously, with the equipage levels and rates that you would expect on 2020, the RF signatures that you're going to see in the airspace will, in fact, from an ADSB perspective, be there. I think that the driver on, if the GA world goes to UAT, there's nothing else on that link. And we have done. Um, lab event and tests and stuff on what could the ground station receive and handle that. And there's enough density and overlap that we should should be able to avoid that. But that could happen. Um, I don't know that we would end up in the path of having to do additional mandates. Our method of handling this thing is we have a technique and an ability to, and you, you can use from a UAT perspective and the way that one's set up, it's once a second is, is what your squit rate is going to be coming out of the UAT. On 1090, you'll hear it's once a second, but it's actually more rapid than that, but they're fragments of the message sets that have to be assembled. 
it's the radio station that has to be dynamic enough to accommodate that. And that's where the, that's where the rubber would hit the road for us at that point. And we have dynamically driven those radios to oversaturate them from anything that we think would be far greater than any aircraft density could be that a one radio would see at a time. And then you've got the overlap of those. So we've done some fairly intensive lab environment tests to test against that. But you're right, the real world environment in 2020, when everyone is equipped, we will see a real uh, event at that point. I think we've done enough due diligence in the test realm to have, at least from our perspective, look at that. But you're right, it's not perfect and it won't be the real one until we get to that point. Um, but we've done significant testing to this point from those specific type events that you've met, you discussed. Any other questions? I can't Hi, think will the FAA require any documented training or evaluation for the user or uh, can the user just go out there and have the system installed on the aircraft and not be aware of the differences uh, in the system? From a pilot's perspective, what he has to know from the... Sure. Uh, that's a great uh, with, question. With I'm sure that I, I don't... <laughs> I'm not a pilot, so I'm going to say that. I, I assume that you have to know what's on your airframe. When you get new avionics installed, you have to know what it is. There's going to be, how do you turn it on? What does it mean? What do the warning lights mean? I, I would assume that that is, in fact, something that you have to know. Uh, I would... I'm not dancing here, but I would ask Jim or Alex out of the booth right behind us. They can give you the specific answer because they come from, from flight standards and aircraft cert from that standpoint. So to the user, there'd be no uh, changes to operating in the, in the air traffic system with this uh, implemented? It should not change how you operate in the airspace, all right, from that standpoint. And, and if that's the question, that, that that's the important part from that, from my part of the response. It, It'll essentially be invisible to you. It's just another surveillance technique that the that air traffic has, and you should know about that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, would you uh, uh, give me those numbers again on what you refer to as the hockey puck? And also, does that apply both to in and out? So the hockey puck is an in capability. All right, it's ADSB in. It's the Traffic Information Services broadcast, the TISB hockey puck, 3,500 feet above and below own ship, and a radius of 15 miles around own ship is the is the minimum that we have. I think in some cases it it, it somewhat exceeds that, but that's the that's it, the minimum that we'll provide. In order to get that service, your aircraft must identify and meet the performance requirements of an appropriate ADS-B out signal to receive the ADS-B in. So you have to have the right integrity and accuracy values and other two values, SDA and SIL, have to be set appropriately to get that. I can't see if there's any other hands raised out there, but if not, I want to thank you all very much for your good questions and your attentiveness, and hopefully I've been able to give you some information that you either did not know or it reinfirms something that you already did know. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Very informative uh, presentation, and I hope we'll have you back again next year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, seminar will be coming up at 11.30, and it's What's New in the Flight Service by George Danell with Lockheed Martin. So please come out and attend the meeting. And if you exit to the north door, I would appreciate it. Thank you and enjoy sun and fun.